Greetings, this is Stephen McKenzie. If you want to learn more about me, there's some links in the description. So this project uh, demonstrates embedded machine learning uh, using the STM32 Cube IDE or the Cube MX. There's two ways of doing it with the integrated X Cube AI extension, which is for uh, machine learning mod model integration and then code generation for like the network uh, framework. And we're also going to take a look at how you deploy a pre-trained Keras model. We're using the text classification that's in the TensorFlow tutorial, although it's constructed a little differently. And this one is optimized for embedded systems and it's I'm using the STM32 Nucleo H7 series, the STM F7. You, you need the more horsepower. And so also the way that I'm measuring success is to achieve uh, parity with Python, uh, comparing the outputs um, in the project uh, with the, against the Python runtime and uh, using the predefined inputs that you need to do. So it's um, the difference in this model is it's a dense only uh, text classification. It's optimized for this board, which doesn't support the embedded feature of the TensorFlow object model. Anyway, so I want to ensure that inference results on the STM32 match those of the original Python implementation. And validating a model consistency. So there's a link in the description if you want to download my project from my GitHub, which has uh, everything set up. It has the model is up there. It has the Python script if you want. You don't need it. Um, also, I have some PDFs that explain how everything works and I also have a Doxygen project. I didn't check in the finished results, but I think the README shows you how to build it. And so everything's there. You can learn a lot. Uh, but also I checked in the output files, which are generated, uh, but they're put in a different place. They're put in with your system uh, libraries and headers for the STM. But I went ahead and checked them in to the project for your convenience. And so what I want to show you now is if you want to start from scratch, creating a new project, which again, you don't have to do if you uh, clone my project, but I'll show you the steps for launching a new cube IDE for checking your updates. If you don't have the Xcube AI extension, um, boards going through the board selection process, generating a new project and so on. And so I guess we'll go ahead and take a look at that now. So I created a new folder called demo. We'll just launch. So I'm going to create a new, well, wait, before I do that, before I do that, I'll show you, I've fired up the STM cube MX. I'm sure you can do this from the IDE, but this is how I know how to do it. So install, remove embedded software packages. And you want to find the Xcube uh, AI packet. And it's under the ST Microelectronics tab. And it's right here. And so you want to go ahead and uh, install that, which I've already done, so I'm not going to do it here. So I've restarted the STM32Cube IDE, and we're going to go new project, new STM32 project. Then you select your board, and this is the one I'm developing with. It's a STM F7 or a Nucleo H723ZG. It's a lot more capable than like STM32 F4 that I normally use. This one is a big upgrade. It has one megabyte of flash memory and 564 KB of distributed RAM. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and select it. 
just going to stick with C, put in the project name, which is demo. I'm going to say yes to initializing all uh, peripherals to default mode. And this will bring us into the GUI that's saved in the .ios file. So here's our view. The first thing I'm going to do is go to the project manager and I'm going to increase the heap size put in hex 1000 hex 2000 for stack size and heap size but um, I could go a lot more than that I could go um, 4000 and 2000 for uh, stack size, but get away with less than that if I want to. Okay, we're back in the pinout and configuration view. And so to get to the uh, AI module, you expand the middleware and software. And here it is X cube AI here on the left. And so you're going to choose artificial intelligence core, check that box. And then for application, there's a few choices. Pick application template and then hit OK then expand it again select it again and here it is here on the left now you're gonna have to there's a main and there's a little plus button here this is adding a network so that brings up this UI and then you're gonna browse for the model and so if you're doing this from scratch you want to use the model that I've checked in. It's at the root of the GitHub repository and the name of the file is text underscore classification underscore dense underscore input dot h5. So we'll select that. Now I'm going to leave the compression to none and optimization to balance just the defaults and then you run analyze. Okay, so analyze complete on the AI model. And we'll take a look at this report in more detail later. So we can click OK. Then we can save. And I just say yes to saving. And it's going to prompt me if I want to generate code. I think there's a bug. It, I closed down the IDE after I finished this step. Uh, because I think a dirty buffer is not getting flushed, so it keeps prompting me whether I want to save and uh, generate code. So here we go, yes. And if this is probably the only time it's necessary to generate code, but I keep saying yes, it doesn't hurt anything. So now it does a device configuration tool updating code. I have my board plugged in, by the way. And so actually that's all I'm going to do here. That's the steps to importing the, uh, the model. And now I'm going to switch over to the checked in project. So I first tried to import just a regular uh, Keras model, but it failed the analysis and it said that the embedding feature uh, wasn't supported and I looked into that. and. The embedded layer maps each word in a vocabulary to a dense vector representation. It's like a lookup table. And it requires a large memory footprint to store the embeddings, which you can't really do on a microcontroller with limited RAM and flash. And so STM's XQBAI framework doesn't support embedded layers. And so um, I went with a dense model and uh, the dense model eliminates the embedded layer and instead uses pre-processed float values. And um, I use Python to get those values. And I'll show you how that works. And so it's direct input to uh, represent the sentiment of each value. I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the tutorial in TensorFlow on the text classification. It, you feed it some lines about the movie was great, the movie was okay, the movie was terrible. And then the model emits a 
sentiment rating and and so uh, right now the great has the lower rating and the it's terrible has a higher rating which is inverted from the tensorflow website so you can flop switch that around if you want but all i care about is if i have parity with the python uh, output and so anyway um the inputs are mapped directly to the first dense layer, which performs a linear transformation to capture the relationship between the values and the model's output. And so this simplifies the memory management and reduces the model's complexity. And if you look at the samples, like the zoo sample and all of that, uh, there's Python in there. And so I think this is the sort of the normative way that you uh, do embedded um, machine learning is side by side with Python. Now, you can, if, if I'm wrong about that, I invite you to interact with me on the GitHub with open an issue or something. So I'm not an expert. And so uh, uh, I appreciate your feedback, but that's my understanding right now. So the key difference is that the original Keras model used embeddings to capture the relationships between the words while the dense model relies on numeric inputs that directly represent the sentiments, like key value pairs. And so this makes the dense model more efficient and compatible with, you know, in a constrained environment. So again, if you cloned my project, you don't have to worry about this, but if you are creating a new project and if semi-hosting works well for you, that's fine. I used UART for printing. And so, uh, you have to make sure you initialize the clock. I do this right in the UART init. And then the biggest thing, though, is you have to sync your settings with, um, I'm on Windows, so if you go to the device manager, there's a virtual port. Uh, here, I'll show you how that works. So I'm just using ST-Link, USB debugger. And you can see here in ports, com, and LPT, it's uh, ST-Link. And then I'll look at the properties and the port settings, the baud rate, you want to make sure the baud rate, which I have at 115200, you have to make sure that maps the code in your initialization of UART3 and also in your, your serial port reader when you're doing the debugging. So I'll show you that too. Uh, so it's data bits 8, parity none, stop bits 1, flow control none. And so now we're in the code, so when the application gets built, it's uh, set at um, baud rate 115200, 8-bit word length, stop bit 1, parity none, and so on. And here's that initialization call right here. Again, you don't have to do anything, I don't think, if you get my project, but if you're doing a new project, you go to uh, Properties, C++, C build, and then settings, and then MCU, MPU post, or I'm sorry, settings. And then see so I have Cortex M7, and I have hardware floating point, and so on. But you have this checked. Use float with printf from new lib nano. It, it boils down to being dash u printf underscore float. So if you have a make file system on Linux or something, just add that to it. So that's and then also you have to um, provide a system write call. And here's that right here. It just printf handles all the format, formatting, format specifiers. But then when it comes actually outputting the formatted string, it calls your, your underbar write. And it basically calls um, URT transmit with a handle to the uh, URT3. Uh, Anyway, that's how that works. So you can copy that from mine or, you know, it's a pretty well-known pattern. Okay, now we're going to start getting into how this thing works. So in your Project Explorer, uh, there's a Xcube AI app folder. And that's right here. And you see these files here. And I'll go back to the slide so you can see it easier. So there's a network underscore generate underscore report dot text and that's where you start and one of the entries in there look for is output dir and it looks for where all your header files and system files are on your system not in your project and it has this um all your output and parameter format that 
the generated code framework uses to do all the work for you mostly. But it's good for you to know the format of your parameters, your layers, and uh, your network. And then in terms of the code that you edit, it's all in here in app underscore x dash cube dash AI dot C. And so we'll take a look at a Doxygen view about that and I'll explain how, how it all works. So the good starting point is the network anal analyze underscore report dot text. I have it here in another editor. And here's that output dir I was mentioning, but I've checked it in uh, underneath the um, X cube AI forward slash app folder for your convenience for to look at it. And so here's some data about uh, your model. And then if you want to look at what the format of its output and its input, it's the same. If you want a very detailed description of the buffers in JSON. You don't have to deal with this though. The framework does it for you. So I've checked in a document called Xcube AI Network Framework and it explains how the generated code works. So the Xcube AI Framework generates code and that abstracts the complexities of running a neural network on the microcontroller. And the generated code you know, provides the essential functionalities for deploying and running and managing the model. Uh, the main components, uh, I'll go over very quickly. There's network initialization. So it um, has a function like named uh, network init or something like that. It sets up the neural network's internal structure. Allocates memory for the weights. And the weight file is huge. It's like 80,000 elements of floats. And that's in data.c. You can take a look at it. But it allocates memory for weights, biases, and other model parameters. It configures the input and output dimensions according to the imported model. I'll tell you right now, this framework only allows you to input one thing at a time and output one thing at a time. But since we run the process step in a loop, you can... Uh, toggle through your input and uh, give it different input each iteration and get different results that way. But you can't like feed it an array of input like you can with Python. So I'll tell you that right now. That's one limitation. It initializes any hardware resources like the clocks or peripherals. It has a init, init function just like it does for any other peripheral. Uh, it has routines for uh, the managing the memory and the buffers during inference. Allocates memory for activations, which are temporary variables used during computation between the layers. It ensures memory alignment and allocation efficiency to op optimize performance on the microcontroller. Handles deallocation and cleanup. Uh, anyway, so it basically it does the uh, memory management. It does the model inference execution. It, um, <clears throat> it's called AI underscore run. And I'll show you that. But it accepts input, processes it through each layer, the neural network, produces predictions. It uses the internal network structure defined during initialization to traverse through the layers, handles all operations such as any matrix multiplication or activations or pooling. Um, and so it's typically called in a loop, like I said. Uh, I'll show you that. It's responsible for data input and output configuration. So you don't have to query the network for input and output buffers. They have a template for you to uh, some functions with some user code explicitly marked. And so it converts the raw data into the expected format. It retrieves it in a format that can be consumed and printed out as long as you have the uh, input indexes for the dense model. And so anyway, uh, I printed out to a serial console. And then it um, adds support for the debugging and profiling. It inserts hooks for logging, uh, provides performance counters, um, and so on. So the conclusion statement is uh, 
Xcube AI framework abstracts much of the complexity of running neural networks on STM32 microcontrollers, providing a robust and efficient code base for deploying AI applications. The generated code handles the full life cycle of a neural network from initialization to inference to cleanup with additional support for debugging and profiling to ensure reliable operation in embedded environments. And so here is one of the generated files that generates seven files. And they're all here under app in Xcube AI directory in your uh, Project Explorer. Um, a lot of macro definitions. There's definitions for the parameters. Here's the weights, the big array of weights. Uh, actually, it's only 600. That's right, we reduced it. And then here's parameters, and these are lots of times loop termination. Here's some API that the framework uses to uh, get the weights, get the parameters, get the activations. But it's this file right here, um, app underscore x dash cube dash ai dot c. This is the user code. But before we start editing our project, uh, let's talk about the pre-processing step with Python, getting Python parity. So we'll jump over to my Linux environment for a second to show you the output. Um, anyway, just an overview here, we run the Python script. We observe the output and the mappings that come out to the console. We we have a simplified vocabulary compared to the TensorFlow tutorial. Uh, there's no tokenization, so we uh, do the resource constraints. And so uh, we use this dense uh, model where we observe the inputs that the Python uses and we directly feed that to the input in our STM project. Okay, I'm here in my Linux environment and the uh, model is in this directory as well as this run underscore inference dot py, which I do have checked in to the project, I think at the root of the project. So we'll go ahead and run it. And here it is. And so the pre-process features are the ones we want to pay attention to. 0 0.8, 0 0.5, 0 0.2. And then the predictions, the movie was great, so it's 0 0.46 and so on. Movie was okay, 0 0.48. Movie was terrible, 0 0.49. So we have the sentiment inverted towards the negative. We could change that in both the Python and in the C, but all I care about is the parity. So you can do that if you want. So now that we know our expected values and those indexes, we're ready to edit the user code. And so you grab those predefined inputs, and we'll jump over to the code for this part. So here's an array of the floats that we use as the indexes, the pre-processed part. You can invert them if you want. If you want it to go the other way, have the sentiment be higher with, with the um, in the positive direction. Uh, and then um, here's the examples. The movie was great. The movie was okay. The movie was terrible. And then I have this global index where I can cycle through because we can only give one input at a time. So we can cycle through them, and we have uh, the process function in the while loop, infinite while loop, so we can see, get a good sample size of it uh, cycling through. Now this is the function that you edit when you, um, there's sort of a to-do. I don't have it here. There's a, an empty project has a to-do. But this is what um, I put in it. So there's just one dimension, so there's no reason to loop. And so we're getting the input data here. So the user code is the um, acquire and process data and the post process. And in between, the model is run, like the inference step. So the user code section, it's marked. To, did I leave that in here? Yeah. User code begin to, user code end to. Um, so the framework provides you with this AI underscore I8 pointer to data array, which is only one dimension. 
as I've mentioned, and the same with the output. And it's this variable that de that defines the size, and it's set to one. A I underscore network in num and out. They're both set to one, so so I don't even bother looping. Uh, so it means the network can only process one single input and produce a single output at a time. And so it's just a single dimension array. It simplifies the structure, but it's you know you don't get to feed it a bulk. Um, anyway, so uh, you remember I grabbed those predefined floats and they're represented here in the predefined input. Uh, and they are fed into the model. Then in the output, after the AI has run, it's executed. Pro, um, again, it's only one dimension, so we cast it to a float because that's the format of our model. And then um, we print out the current example that was fed in and the prediction, and that's it. So we'll do a debugging session. So you have to be patient while the debugger is, um, you want to wait till after it flashes. It hasn't even done it yet. So now it's flashed and now it's stopped in main. And here's our terminal. I use the terminal app. And so you click on this and I pick serial terminal. COM port 6 is the one my device manager is set to, and hit OK. And so now um, let's make sure I have a breakpoint. OK, so I printed out some values in the input stage. That's why I have some input already. Um, that hard-coded float index is 0 0.8. So now we're getting the uh, output from the network after it's processed it. So we'll step over that. OK, so we'll step over this. We'll go ahead and resume till it goes through to the next time through. And you see, <clears throat> here's the prediction, which matches. And the movie was OK, matches the output of the Python. And we're cycling through it again, back to movie is great. So. We have parity with the Python, so that's basically the demo. So a quick re re recap. We've created a new project in STM32 Cube IDE. We selected the board. We enabled the X Cube AI middleware. We imported the dense model. We created a new network and selected the model file. We analyzed the model. We generated the code ran the analysis to verify the compatibility, generated all the code again, configured properties, uh, project properties for printing and UART. We increased the stack and heap size. Then we set up the UART on the receiving ends on the virtual COM port in device manager and in the serial port uh, listener. We walk through the Python script for pre-processing values and to establish uh, comparison parity values. Uh, we grab the inputs to use as indices to map the uh, input to the float. And so anyway, I'll leave a link to the GitHub. And if you want to give me feedback, you can do it in the form of issues in the GitHub, and I'll uh, give uh, more information uh, in the uh, description of the YouTube. So I think that's it. 
Uh, thanks for your attention and don't be afraid to contribute.